Jillian, Phil, it's so fantastic to have you both with me here today for what I'm sure will be an incredibly interesting conversation. Brilliant to be here. Well, welcome to the exchange, both of you, and thank you very much for having me to join the conversation. So I think the last time we saw you two was actually on a video celebrating the third birthday of Zilch, uh, which I have to say, Phil, just congratulations to you and your team for the past three years. It's been phenomenal how much you've transformed financial services for the better. But that sounds like a really good place for us to start. And I know, Julia, you asked Phil, are you keen to list or are you looking to stay private? And Phil, you mentioned you were indeed keen to list and there were some things that you were really looking to the LSE for, you and founders and entrepreneurs from all over the world. I would be keen to hear a little bit about maybe your top three priorities of what you think needs to be done to really secure the, the LSE as a place to attract companies like Zilch from all over the world to list. Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. We, we had a conversation a few weeks back and we were talking exactly about this, which is, you know, you've got this, we've got a, a UK business, you know, that's, that's built out now internationally, growing in the US as well, but fundamentally was born here, you know, is, is, is of great scale here already. And what we're doing is we're looking at kind of what is the next best steps for this company um, on our corporate finance strategy. And if you actually look at that, uh, my co-founder and I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we build more value in the company and then how do we return great value to shareholders? And we've always said we think listing the company is a great almost starting point for us to really fr uh, flourish as a firm. And, and we were having a conversation a few weeks back just about this and talking about, well, where would that be, right? And, and the LSE is something that has always interested us anyway as a, as a UK-born firm. But obviously growing in, in the US, you've got the likes of the NASDAQ, et cetera, that are obviously saying, well, you know, as you grow your customer base in the States, that's something that's also very interesting you guys should consider, which is obvious. So what do you do about that and how do you think about that? And for us, really, we think about this in a few ways, but liquidity policy is certainly two of the major things and perception, right, mm -hmm. if, if, if I had to name three. And, and at a very high level, and I'm sure we'll get into it and talk about it, but what we really after is just, I would say clarity would really be useful and helpful um, on a number of fronts in, in the UK at the moment. There's a lot going on, there's a lot changing and, and there's a big nod to Julia and the team. I mean, it's the first time anyway, I've at least seen and experienced a major shift of momentum, certainly, which is exciting. So, so really actually for the first time we genuinely sit here and go, wow, is the LSE a place that we could actually list a uh, a higher risk, but high growth fintech business that's transforming the way people pay, but it's a, it's a long-term big picture story. It's something that we need people to buy into and hold. And, and there's a lot going on in the market across the piece, whether that's if you look at regulation and of course policy, things like taxation, how are we thinking about SEIS, EIS, EMI, the different stages and levels of the company as we grow, perception around this as well, um, and then liquidity, right? Once we, once we move to that next step and how are we stimulating all of this and, and what examples are we following where, where you see a, pretty, a number of pretty interesting things going on in different countries or jurisdictions to stimulate um, people buying, for instance, stocks that are from that country on that exchange and so on and so forth, which we can talk a bit about. But these are the things generally that are occupying our mind space. And, and frankly, we've had a number of good dialogue already today. And we're, exciting to see, we're excited to see some action being taken on that. Um, but I don't know if, if Julia, you want to you talk to some of those points. Well, there's a, there's a huge agenda. I mean, yeah. Ginny, I don't know if you want to tell me where you want me to start. Well, I think some of the points that Phil has made are really fantastic. So is there anything that you can address today now about some of the progress you're making in your vision as well? Yeah. Well, let me take a step back. So the, the first thing to say is the UK is already in a really good position. And the first thing that I think we should all be really proud of is the strength of our fintech sector. And, and that goes from the regulatory sandbox approach that we took that was the first in the world to creating the, the venue and the ecosystem that could drive great companies like Zilch um, and the fact we are a world leading multi-asset capital market. So when you combine the fact we start these great fintechs and we already are a globally leading capital market, the more we can just connect the two together effectively and make sure that each is serving the other as effectively as they can do, the better. But it's a great place to start. 
Um, and our competition is with the US because, I mean, by any measure, we're the largest capital market in Europe. Um, I think even this week, we've, we've got more capital raising than almost the next two European venues combined for this year alone. So desp despite some of the perceptual pieces where people will tell you things are otherwise, the actual facts bear scrutiny, which is very different. Um, but you, don't, you never sit on your laurels. Uh, I mean, a few weeks ago, we were talking about how you continuously think about the evolution of the business model. I've got the same duty as well. Um, and I would say I run a 300-year-old fintech. That's actually my job. Um, because fundamentally what we do is, is very similar to the role that we have played as a convening venue throughout our history. The technology we use to do it is absolutely transformed from the days, say, 150 years ago. We'd only just banned football and fireworks from the floor of the trading floor of the exchange. So that gives you a sense of our evolution. Um, but if I look at the evolution today, I always talk about this change and transformation as five fingers in a glove. Um, and then you can tell me whether it actually hits the marks of the things that you're focused on. Sure. I, hope, I hope that it does, but that's the exam question for me today. So the first of the five fingers is what are the primary market rules? What are the rules that companies have to follow to list on the venue? But also what are the secondary capital raising rules? Because one of the things I say repeatedly, and in a hackneyed way, I get it, but I think hopefully people understand the point, is that a listing is for life, not just for Christmas. Um, and I used to run a bank as well. And actually understanding what your value is, what your market cap is, what flexibility it then gives you in terms of your freedom of maneuver from a regulatory and other point of view is critical, actually. So it isn't just about that first IPO moment, however much people focus on that. It's actually the ongoing access to capital that it affords. And London has always had that as an enormous strength. But we want to make sure that we make it more straightforward, more nimble, recognize that by the time companies are coming back for more capital, they've got an established track record of disclosure already. So how do we speed that up? That reform that the FCA is already undertaking um, with the primary markets effectiveness review, the secondary capital raising review, and the prospectus reform, all of which is currently in train, um, is actually transformational. It does one really valuable thing, two really valuable other things on top of everything that's already changing. Um, one is it enables forward-looking statements to be put into prospectuses without the a need for a crystal ball that one might have had with other liability. Now, if you think about companies where they're either pre-rev or there's a great deal of future ahead of them or very IP-based, then the ability to actually put those forward-looking statements into your prospectus is, is radically important, particularly in, your, in the fintech sector. Um, the other is it actually enfranchises retail much more. And actually starts breaking down some of the barriers that have meant that retail um, have found it harder and harder to access markets. Now, when you're a B2C business like yours, Actually, the following that your consumers have um, is a really interesting part of it. And how we can give companies that option to have more of that access to the market as well and that underpinning is, I think, a really interesting facet of it. That is all in train right now. The second thing we focus on is research provision. How do we make sure that the sell side is actually incentivized to provide high quality research, particularly in the sectors that the UK excels at? Uh, and that includes fintech, it includes actually advanced manufacturing, it includes life sciences, et cetera. But a lot of those are vision things. You know, they're deep in the technical weeds and you need to be able to spend your time and energy on that. So how do we make sure that structure is incentivized in the UK effectively? The Rachel Kent review that was announced at Mansion House goes a very long way to do that. Our job now is just to make sure that that happens. The, the third piece of the puzzle is the availability. You, you talked about liquidity, but to me, I talk about is availability of risk capital. Um, the UK has the second largest single pot of available capital in the world, which is our pension pots yeah. and insurance pots of 4.7 trillion. The reality is a disproportionate amount of that right now is invested in fixed income rather than in equities, both private and public. And the entire debate that is happening right now about um, pension transformation is very much about redirecting that capital pool back into the UK and back into risk capital um, for the benefit of pensioners who should be deploying more capital at risk in order to get higher returns to make sure they've got the pots they need um, for, for their retirement. Um, and that transformation has already been announced at Mansion House. We can see, I suspect, more reforms coming through. But we've already had the pension regulators say, actually, pension funds should be focused on return, not cost, and therefore not just buying the cheapest to originate sort of assets that they can, and also focus on whether they need to consolidate to be big enough to have the sophistication to understand the value propositions of the future. Now, that's already a big transformation in mindset that we have seen over the last couple of years in the UK. The fourth thing that we talk about is corporate governance. What are the demands and pressures put on companies when they actually come to market? And the UK has always been a center for really, really good, high quality corporate governance. One of the things that's happened over the last few years, though, is it's become more of a checkbox exercise. And it's partly because of the role of proxies, and it's partly because the more you do things at scale, the more checkboxes are easier, and I understand that. 
but it is a complier explain regime. So let's get back to a complier explain regime and make sure that stewardship is about genuine partnership between asset owners and managers and the companies about how you steward the company to create value because that's fundamentally what it's about. Yeah. Um, not as an oppositional proposition, but how you fundamentally create value. But also, are asset owners and managers helping companies do the things that they need to do to create that value? So as you go global, you're going to need specialists in the different markets that you want to go and go after. Sure. And the price point for those specialists is going to be different depending on the market. And you're going to need the flexibility to make sure that you can hire those people at those price points, because that's how you create the value and the value ultimately for stakeholders. And making sure that the UK is having that conversation is, is part of that. And the fifth finger, um, which although in my hand is the littlest, it's not the littlest, <laughs> um, is actually what is the ecosystem for scaling private companies? Because too often, the private company markets have been from Mars and the public markets are from Venus. I don't know which one because I haven't read the book, so I can't really allocate <laughs> which, which should be which. But we've treated them as two completely separate ecosystems. And actually, it's people like you who are the common link going, having to navigate between the two, rather than the systems actually working to match you together. And, and there's a lot of elements to that. It's how do we make sure that the tax support that we have in the UK, EIS, SEIS, VCT, all of that, actually works for scaling, not just starting. Because sometimes some of the structures cap off at certain sizes and disincentivize that next level of scale. EMI I want to, would be a good example. EMI would be a very good example. I want us to be radically ambitious as a country. I want us to create globally consequential companies from the UK, which means we need to incentivize that scaling all the way through, and our system needs to do the same thing. And so there is an awful lot of work going on about what those reforms could be. But the other piece of the puzzle, and you talked about liquidity through several lenses today, um, but the private markets have a challenge of liquidity. Effectively, very often there are only two exit routes. Um, one is a trade sale. Um, and very often that means that the CEOs and the founders who created all this value don't get to marshal it and curate it the way they want to into the next stage of a company's life. And sometimes you can lose great companies from the UK because you forget that they're even British and they've been lost and absorbed into some uh, bigger piece. Um, and so that is one element of the, of the constraint. And we do a very good job of creating scale, but then losing it just at the point that it can go hypersonic. And I want us to have that ambition from the UK. But the other point is, is an IPO. And an IPO is absolutely a really powerful tool for a company. It has to be the right tool at the right time for the right reasons. Um, and so one of the things that we're working with the government on is the world's first crossover market between public and private. Um, and the idea is that it would be a regulated market that could be run by any venue operator in the UK who had the right license um, that would enable you to have an auction of your secondary shares as a private company. So you don't need to reincorporate, but you are a private company. Keep being a private company for all other purposes. And it will provide angel and seed investors with the opportunity to get out, but at a price transparent basis in terms of there being a form of price discovery that they can see and have confidence in. Enable institutions to start following companies so that the first time they meet them isn't the first time they go on a roadshow for the IPO, which again goes to understanding those value propositions and having confidence in the track record of management to deliver value creation and revenue accretion such that it's not a kind of big leap when you get to an IPO point. Sure. Um, also to give um, VCs and PEs another exit strategy that means that they don't have to force a company into something that they don't actually want to do. And critically, provide a liquidity event for staff as well. Um, and to me, I hope that that means that really great British companies who use this venue would be more attractive employers than their peers or competitors in other jurisdictions who don't have the opportunity to do this, because it's a wonderful mechanism of retaining talent. So we are working with the government and the FCA on that idea, and our hope is that by the end of next year, that would be up and running, and that would be the first in the world. But it would help us really address how we scale the CD and E capacity, round capacity that we need in the UK, to actually enable us to follow these brilliant companies, particularly fintechs, that we're starting. Um, so all of that is in train, and that's remarkable. If you th thought about where we were three years ago to where we are today, an awful lot of that, all of that is work in progress. It's not we need to start it. It is we are on the track to delivering it yeah. and the time frame, some point between the end of this year and the end of next year. The final bit, the glove, is the culture and how we talk about it around here. Yeah. Um, and, and look, I'll make a point about the city. I think it has a habit, as a lot of professional services industries do. They talk in their own self-referential language that actually disenfranchises other people. Um, and if we talk as in terms of basis points and big cover ratios, it's not surprising half the country switches off, you know. Mm. Um, and how we actually, and, and when we spoke a few weeks back, 
your way of describing the journey that Zilch has been on and the business model it's got, is that real nuts and bolts personal experience for people of how they go through interacting with your company and the problem it's solving. And capital markets are about financing people to solve problems for other people. And that's the thing we don't talk about the city of. We don't say that the city is full of problem solvers who are trying to make other people's lives better and, and give them the opportunity to create value and have a better quality of life. We don't talk about it as the mechanism that generates the returns for pensioners or the ability to generate jobs, higher paying jobs, tax revenue that pays for the NHS. But that's yeah. what we do. Um, and so we need to be able to celebrate it and talk about it in those terms and also celebrate entrepreneurship. And that's, that's the, the main hope I have that, and one of the things I'm so delighted we're doing this because this is a prime example of exactly what we want to celebrate. But entrepreneurship is a wonderful thing. People picking themselves up, dusting themselves off, going again, trying, learning, taking that. You're an, a wonderful example of it. You took that learning. The, the first thing you tried in South Africa didn't actually work out as you'd anticipated. It worked out really well, but not, not, not the, the plan you had. Yeah. And then you've taken that learning and applied it to really solving people's problems in the UK and now around the world. That's, that's to be celebrated. And yet we don't talk about those stories enough through that lens. And so one of the things I hope that comes out of this shift in everything that's happening in the UK is that we really can celebrate this dynamism and entrepreneurship that we foster so much of, yeah. but then we just need to help it run through the tape. So I've got reasons to be pretty optimistic. Well, so Julie, I'm going to ask you on that because I think you've just given such a fantastic description of everything that's already happening to even further strengthen the UK as the place to list. And I have to say, I share a lot of that ambition. I really believe the UK is the best place in the world to start a business, to scale a fintech business and to grow a fintech business. And I particularly love the reference where you talked about the city as being problem solvers at the end of the day. And this point about how important it is for us to celebrate the fintechs yeah. and the entrepreneurs that are transforming financial services for the better. Uh, now, I have to ask both of you then, on to that last point. What is it that you are optimistic about going forward? I'm optimistic about the consensus and the commitment and, and the momentum behind all of this change. You know, I've never heard the city talk about itself and talk about its evolution in as coherent a fashion um, as we are doing today. You, you have to recognize the need and the impetus to change in order to generate change, let's, let's be clear. So these are healthy conversations to have, but there's a real consensus about the direction of travel. And there is cross-party consensus, and there is genuine action taking place in all the different places where it needs to take place in order for these five different elements to actually have change affected to them. And that's, that's the reason I, I have to be optimistic. Um, and, and when you think about the starting point we're in, and then you think about the, the fact of the optimization from here. It's a really powerful message for where we're going in the future, I think. Right. Phil. Yeah, I think I think cross party consensus is the you know, is is, is one of the shining gems uh, that we're experiencing here. And that's that's encouraging for us to see. I mean, the other thing is we're having this conversation. Um, you know, and we're able to have an ongoing dialogue. This is not the first time we've had a discussion. You know, there's been numerous conversations. And I would certainly say that if I'm if I think about conversations happening between us and other firms, I'd love to know what you think, by the way, um, you know, with your firm. But certainly it seems that there is this momentum building. So all, all the credit goes to you guys for that. There's no doubt about it. But people are seemingly more optimistic that at least there is a dialogue and that's being heard. You know, in the past, you, you mentioned scaling, things like EMI. It's you don't have to try very hard to see why it needs to change. Um, you know, really, it seems as though today it's first time the startup group of people who are in the business first really benefit. And then as the business scales and grows, it's really tough to, to incentivize heavy hitting big names to join the firm and to benefit in the same way. So we should, we should do something about that, you know, and we can have that conversation. Certainly, you know, you could go across, across the spectrum of taxation, you look at exempt, exempt of at um, transactions, things like this, which obviously all, all of this stuff needs to be considered. But I would say what I'm optimistic about is there's a dialogue, uh, numerous things we've discussed. I mean, as you mentioned, liquidity uh, as a private firm and the platform that's going to be rolling out. We're excited, obviously, to see that come to market. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that anywhere else in the world. So all of that changes the game fundamentally. And, and the fact that we're having the dialogue and can talk about these things, from my point of view, is obviously meaningful. And, and everyone else we're talking to kind of 
on the founder's side um, is excited about that. So certainly we're very optimistic about where everything's headed. Of course, ultimately, our shareholders and our investors are excited about everything we're doing and the progress we've made. We must still deliver. <laughs> and that is the challenge, right? So we, we're just getting going. And, and by we, I, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm talking about our business and, and certainly all of the changes happening on your side. And so ultimately we still have to deliver. We were just joking about this earlier uh, with some of the team here actually and saying, we've got to do our thing and you've got to do yours. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to go and deliver the numbers. We've got to create an amazing product, um, you know, for millions of consumers um, and, and deliver the revenue and the profit. And ultimately, um, you guys have to go and do I've your thing to, to yeah, make sure there's a home for a company like yeah, that. Absolutely. But I've got to say, and to answer your question, Phil, as well. So obviously, I run Innovate Finance as the industry body and the voice of UK fintech. And from that position where I sit, I'm incredibly optimistic about the future. And one of the reasons, and it's very much to your point, is because we are able to sit in rooms and have these types of discussions and have different stakeholders coming together, identifying maybe some of the obstacles, looking at creating solutions and ensuring that all of us together, whether that's industry, government regulators, are moving in the same direction to help support these innovators and make the UK the best place in the world for fintechs. Uh, so I am, I'm very positive about the future. And thank you both so much for joining me. It has been fantastic speaking with both of you and hearing about some of the great plans for both of your companies as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.